um, and that's reflecting on me being the wizard of business yeah. in Australia. It was written by a client, strangely enough, and Dan has written the foreword for it. Oh, really? And and read it and loved it. And he said, my friend Mal Emery. Uh, now, I know he thinks I'm a bit of a rascal too, and I alluded to that uh, in my... Uh, Why does he think that? Oh, because, well, he'd think that uh, with great love and respect in his heart because entrepreneurs do push the boundaries. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm one that has probably, you know, and continue to. And I did make a comment in my PS, in my letter to him, of gratitude that hopefully he has love in his heart for lovable rascals like myself. Um, because he's probably one himself. That would be my yeah. um predetermination so um i'm trying to put that in in perspective for you um you know dan dan and bill used to teach steal and distribute for example Mm -hmm. um they changed the terminology later on because uh, they didn't really want you to steal their stuff but at the same time i'm listening to dan uh, at the moment as i always do and he's talking about how the deeper he digs um, the more he finds out that someone else created just about everything. Uh, and one of the stories he tells is the um, the Wall Street Journal letter. Are you familiar Mm-mm. with that, Jeremy? No, no. Well, the Wall Street Journal letter is one of the most famous letters ever written in history. Uh, and it might, if you type it into the internet, you'll get a copy of it. Mm-hmm. So you don't need to um, search too hard. And um, what it tells is the story of two fictitious people Uh, and we see this story repeated over and over and over again in copy uh, in various methodologies and essentially what it says is we we followed two guys Uh, for all intents and purposes they had the same education background Um, uh, they were the same age they went to the same school and 20 years later uh, they got married, um, had two kids, live in a nice suburb, but 20 years later, one guy owns the company mm-hmm. and the other guy's working for the company. Mm-hmm. What was the difference? Mm-hmm. And of course, in this scenario, being the Wall Street Journal letter, it was that he'd read the Wall Street Journal letter. He, he subscribed okay. to their to their letter monthly or whatever right. it was. Or joined your coaching course, program. Well, conversely, right. it could be anything, right. you know, because it's so, so it's famous for being the Wall Street Journal. I got you. I have definitely read that in many different forms now that you yeah, talk I'm about sure. it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And that's exactly, for example, I, I'm pretty sure over there in your country, uh, they go on um, TV and say, this guy belonged to that superannuation fund or that company, and here's how much money he had when he retired, and this girl belonged to that superannuation company, and she only had that much money. What was the difference? Now, that's the Wall Street Journal letter. (laughs) That's exactly what it is. Now, it might not be superannuation in your company. That's what it's called in our country to look after people when they get older. Right. Uh, but Dan alluded to the fact that he discovered that someone else wrote that letter, you know, 20, 30, 40 years before the Wall Street Journal. So, mm-hmm. you know, so that's been constantly knocked off, stolen and distributed, if you like. And right. very rarely do we ever find the original source. Uh, but needless to say, you know, you'd have to go back a long way. Yeah, for sure. So I'll let you start where you want to start. Yeah. Yeah. And- I'll have some nuggets for you. Yeah, oh, I know it because I have about 13 pages of notes that I've taken uh, on your videos and your blog posts already. Oh, okay. So, yeah, research. Yeah, for you. sure. Always. Love to see you do your homework. Yes, definitely. You have to. Um, all right. Do you want to wait for your coffee and water? Should we? Uh, no, no, roll? not at all. Not at all. This all is right. this is this is a gorilla video or warts and all. I love it. All right. <laughs> all right, Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm excited. I'm so glad he came in on a Friday. He doesn't come in normally, but he came in for us because. We messed up the schedule somehow, but we have Mel Emery, who's one of the legends of marketing and copywriting. Mel has over 40 years in business and has generated tens of millions of dollars for himself and his clients. 
He has bought and sold about 25 different businesses, and he has one of the largest coaching and consulting businesses on the planet. And we're going to find out about both of those. And just to give you a little bit of an idea of his coaching business, in the last four years, he's had over 1,200 people sign up for his $8,000 a year coaching program. He has had he has over 10 people paying between 50,000 and 150,000 for his private coaching per year. Mal, thank you so for, so much for joining me from Australia. Uh, you're more than welcome. There's one other stat we should have upgraded Go there, ahead. and it's really the fact that it's I've taught my clients how to make hundreds of millions. So tens of millions is probably a bit selling us a bit short there. Yeah. And if I could just add to that, uh, it's all about positioning and why these folks should listen to me. Yes. I'm also known in this country as the millionaire maker and the multi-millionaire yes. maker because I have more documented proof of helping ordinary people like the folks listening to this yeah. uh, create uh, their dreams uh, of having a lot of money. So mm -hmm. that's just a fact also mm -hmm. if you did some research. I'm glad you point. mentioned yeah. that because let's start off talking about that. What's one of your favorite case studies of you took an ordinary person and what they were able to create with, you, with your coaching? Yeah, all right, great. We'll start right there. It wasn't the story I was going to tell based well, on the question you asked me, I'm but, gonna, but no, let's go that. there first. Yeah. No, let's go there first. Yeah. We'll get to that. So let's let's deal with that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wind the tape right back. Uh, so your clients, the folks listening to this, uh, will understand uh, how behind all disaster in or adversity, if you like, there's a greater and better opportunity. Now I will add, provided it doesn't kill you, because my previous wife did get ovarian cancer uh, and it was a very bad case of ovarian cancer, mm -hmm. both ovaries category four and it oh. did unfortunately, she lost her life to that. Sorry to hear that. So I, no. I, that's fine. Uh, mm -hmm. Behind all that darkness is another opportunity because I've remarried and, and things have changed but there was a very dark time in my life and of course we're still in hers and she lost that battle. So when I say behind all adversity, I don't mean the something that might kill you. So um, it, it's proven to be the case all my life and I will uh, in some way uh, lead to that as well during this conversation. But here's what happened. I was running a, an event called the Ultimate Million Dollar Marketing Expert. It was $3,000 to attend. It was 2002 and it had double your money back and 140 people attended. Hmm. Uh, none of them asked for their money back, even though I was prepared to offer double their money back. I do admit to being somewhat scared at the time, <laughs> but as it turns out, if you deliver, most people, law of reciprocation yep. won't hit you up. But there's always that less integrity to person in the room that might hit you up, in fact. Mm -hmm. But in the room at that time, and I didn't know him, was a guy called Carl Smith. And a few years later, Carl had the need to call me because as the industry leader in what he did, his business was literally destroyed by a decision made by someone else, the government, as it turns out, of Australia, destroyed their business. Now, the equivalent of this might be you have a retail business and someone blocks off the road. You know, um, you are in control of a product and the originator of that product overnight decides to cut off your distribution. Right. Uh, it might be that Google, who own the sand pit, which is worth $200 million, and it's nothing personal, decide that what you do online they don't like. And overnight, they switch off your business. Right. And I have clients that that has happened to, and I'm sure you know of some also. And it's not as if you did something wrong. And, and these folk didn't do anything wrong. So to explain to you what exactly happened, in our country, we bought in a thing called the GST. Uh, it was introduced by our, our, our Prime Minister, uh, your President, if you like, um, to the country, uh, and, and it was a 10% value-added tax. I think you know that terminology from the Canadians. They call it a value-added tax. So you get it. So suddenly everything went up 10%. And um, it went through Parliament, and uh, what happened was a phenomenon. Now, my clients, as it would have it, repair cracked heads to the motors of cars. So if I can elaborate on that, um, yeah. your car starts bubbling 
air through its radiator uh, and essentially what's happened is the the head has been overheated and it's become cracked and carbonized and that head needs to be replaced and it usually is you've gone to a mechanic or Kmart you know or some auto center and you, you've said to them my car's running rough what's wrong with it and they have a look at it and pull it apart and say it needs a new head so my clients, who I didn't really know that well at this stage, repaired those motors. So if, if you like, they came in one door, cracked and twisted and bent, and they went through, you know, 10 or 12 processes, each person doing their thing to the motor, and it comes out in a shiny box or shiny and new with all the gaskets and goo and all the stuff it needs uh, to be ordered by a mechanic when he needs one. In other words, it's an exchange. You send me your old one uh, as an exchange. We then fix that, or my clients do. They're called All Head Services. And, and then uh, we send you the brand new one. And we make a substantial profit doing that. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty clear to everybody listening to this, don't yeah, you think? Yeah, for sure. There's the exchange of value. So we've explained who the buyer is. The ultimate buyer is the client whose car's stuff's up uh, then there's the client that repairs the car that's the mechanic and then of course there's my guys who fix the dang thing right. and out she goes so mr howard prime minister howard was lobbied by various action groups with the introduction of the gst to see that their industry wasn't impacted it's the first time in history such a tax had ever been implemented and one of those lobbies was the car motor industry and they were scared of upsetting, you know, the manufacture of vehicles and so on and so forth. And they, they said that if we suddenly have a 10% increase in the value of cars, there'll be this massive buying frenzy before the tax and it'll destroy the industry after the tax. So Mr. Howard listened to certain influential groups mm -hmm. and he actually gave them some, some breaks in the tax Hmm. In, in the way it was implemented for the car industry. Now, what this meant was a phenomenon happened. And that phenomenon, and this, unless you were my clients, Carl and Mark, you wouldn't even know it happened. The man in the street didn't know. But what happened, because of the marketing that went on about all of this, you suddenly stopped repairing your car. And instead of repairing your car because of the amazing brakes you could have, uh, uh, incentives that the car industry was offering, you now didn't sell your car, sorry, didn't repair your car. You instead traded it in and someone gave you more money than you expected for it and you bought a new Hyundai or Toyota for $8 a week. It was a phenomenon. Hmm. And you wouldn't even know. And Mr. Howard, our Prime Minister, did not deliberately destroy their business. But that's what happened, uh, without doubt, a phenomenon. Yeah. So my clients had come along to several of my events. And they, they knew enough to what I call get yourself in the shit, not enough to get yourself out of the shit. And they tried something. And if we're being polite, we can call it crap if you like. You can be but they knew whatever. Enough. You don't have to be polite with me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting that the word, I can even tell you the uh, the source of the original word shit. It, it, it came with the British ships. with their. Well, they had cattle in the bottom of the ships. And um, the obviously the cattle, you know, urinated and, and did what cattle do. Right. And it all went to the bottom of the boat. And so they had a signs on, on the walls of the boats that said, store higher in transit. And that meant store all your, the things you want to eat and, and your storage stuff, not on the ground, right. because it was going to get full of crap. So if you look at the acronym, store high in transit, that's where the term shit came oh. from. So it's not even a bad term. Um, Leave it to a master from, marketer to know the, yeah. the back story <laughs> to this oh, stuff. Yeah. You, again, you asked me about how flawed I am and some stories about me. We shouldn't go there because this will go for too long. That's okay. <laughs> but uh, th that's the, that's the, uh, original, um, that's the origination of that term. So okay. it's not such a bad term after all. I got it. 
So anyway, um, my clients knew enough to get themselves in the crap, but not enough to get themselves out. And they eventually um, rang me. So they tried something and it didn't work. But then they rang me. And the conversation went exactly like this. Because they'd been clients, they got through to me after several weeks. And uh, I took their phone call, and this is exactly how the conversation took place. I said, so what's happened? And they told me that story, their business being destroyed. And um, I asked them the question uh, that all of us, and God herself, I'm sure God is a, a female, God herself could not have fixed it if they couldn't have said what they said to me on this phone call. So I said to them, and they went on to elaborate that the whole industry has been destroyed and their business is about to be destroyed. They owe 300000 to the tax man. They own hundreds of thousands of dollars to their creditors. Um, they've got about three months trading in them and 37 staff are going to lose their jobs. They're going to lose their houses. They're going to lose their wives, their education. They're going to lose everything if they don't fix it. And they've owned this business for 20 years. Mm. So I asked them this question. And here it is. Does anyone still buy and repair motors? Now, God, her or himself could not fix that business if no one was mm. repairing the motors. So here's a golden nugget. You can only ever go after and have a disproportionate share of what is available in a category, industry or niche. So I said to them, I can fix it. Please hop on an aeroplane, fly to Perth, and we'll have the conversation. But if they had said to me, no, no one buys these things anymore, that's, that's called a market, uh, we're dead. We're going home. Mm -hmm. I would have advised them to close the doors and, and end this now, end this grief, and take the knowledge that you've learned to recreate something mm -hmm. where... Hopefully, a decision such as this doesn't destroy you in spite of you being an industry leader. Mm -hmm. So they hopped on a plane. Mark was there and Carl was there in my office. And I asked them the question every single person listening to this should ask themselves. And if they don't have an answer to it, if they're in business, then they are not doing as well as they should do or could do. Mm -hmm. And here's the question. Why should my pl clients, my prospects, buy from me as opposed to each and every other person in my category or niche. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I stump everybody right there, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. I can barely ever get an answer to that question. But now, you know, after 40 years of doing this, I've got a whole bunch of clients that can go like that, mm -hmm. okay, because they've now answered that question. Mm -hmm. So... You know, I have a guy that builds project homes and he says, come and buy a home off me, live in it for three months. If you don't want to keep it, if you don't love it, if it's not where you see yourself staying for the next 10 years, I will buy it back. Now, that's what my clients do. And, of course, mm -hmm. it's all based on maths and psychology. And, and um, then we have someone that builds patios. And he says, if your patio is not everything I settled to be, I'll rebuild it, rip it down, start again, or you know, hire someone else to rebuild it for you and pay them if it's not everything I say it is. Now, this is how you get tremendous, well, um, momentum in business. And to bring it closer to home, that was a guy called Tom Monaghan when he said piping hot pizza delivered to your door in 30 minutes or free. Right. It was, um, this is closer to home as in the US. It's, um, yeah. it's Federal Express. When it has to be there overnight, Fed express it. If it's not overnight, we'll give you your money back. So it shouldn't come as a revelation to people listening, but what sh does come as a revelation is an answer to that question. Right. So with my clients sitting there, or prospective clients, they couldn't answer it. They were dumbfounded. They said those pathetic comments like, oh, we make good motors, we do a good job. Well, unfortunately, that is a given that's an expectation a basic expectation of the market mm -hmm. that i mean the basic expectation of the market today is that your product is transformational but however uh, if you're a great marketer it doesn't have to be 
Um, but if you had both, both a transformational product and a great marketing system, well, the, you, you know, that's the ideal scenario. Mm-hmm. So these guys were doing a marvellous job on repairing motors, and I never touched that. But however, I said, why should I buy your motor? And they said, those mundane, boring, no one's pants catch on fire comment like, well, we make good motors. Well, it's not enough. It's right. never been enough. And expecting your product to be your passport to wealth is a flawed concept because there's too many great products that never see the light of day, as we all well know. So a lot of people get blocked up on that because I speak to tens of thousands and I say, you know, put up your hand if you don't make a great product or service. And no one puts up their hand. You know, they all think that's their passport, but it's not. So that's another golden nugget. The quality of your product is not your passport to your success Mm -hmm. financially. Yeah. So with that, with that, I saw the conversation was going absolutely nowhere. And the next question when you can't answer the first question, and here it is, is what's your client's biggest fear, fears, frustrations, wants, desires, and needs? Now that means you've then just flipped from your wants to their needs. Mm-hmm. Now there's another golden nugget. It's incredibly childish to say, I want a ton of money. I want to travel the world. I want to put my kids through private school. I want to live in Hawaii. That's incredibly childish from a business point of view and perspective. Because what it's about is the want of the client, not your want. Now, the, the best place to find out that is to ask them. And there's wonderful things like Survey Monkey and so on and so forth these days online that have helped us marketers become better at this when our forefathers you know, had to find out the hard way by running an ad somewhere in a newspaper. So we are very fortunate to be born when we are. So, of course, I turned to my clients and said, so that's going nowhere. You don't know why they should buy, um, but your clients know why they should buy. So what's their biggest fears, frustrations, wants, desires and needs? They then were dumbfounded. They didn't know the answer. So I am somewhat impatient and I said, look, guys, let's just cut to the chase and I'll, I'll reveal to you based on my um, 30 years of expensive experience uh, what it is they want more than anything. And this is a mechanic. This is the head of Kmart for the motor division. This is the, the head of one of your automotive barns that that have a, a franchise in, in every, you know, city and town and suburb, if you like. Would you know what their biggest frustration might be, Jeremy, if I could just test you for a moment, not to want to embarrass you? No, you just test me, yeah. Um, so what do you think their biggest mechanic? I mean, they want to make their customer happy so they don't come back and return the pro. I mean, I would think they want a happy customer and so they can sell more of these and not have people returning to them. That's true, but the problem with having a happy customer, when, does, when do you have a happy customer? Mm-hmm. After they buy. Right, right. So it's a flawed explanation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so the only time someone knows you're great and your motor's great is when? After they buy. Right. So it's what happens before the sale that's critically far more important than anything you could mention mm-hmm. uh, there and without wanting to embarrass you in any way. No, go ahead, yeah. It's absolutely correct that you want to create happy clients and that is a given and the basics of business. But however, it's flawed in the process because the only way they know you're great is after they buy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's a catch there, isn't there? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, and I'm having a coffee. I'm hoping you're you're up in the middle of the night for this appointment, aren't you, with us on, with me on the phone? Is that right? I stay, up, I stay up late, so I'm good, yeah. Okay. Well, I hope you got a cup of coffee <laughs> or something to keep you uh, going there. Your stories keep me uh, going. So. Mate, and yeah. I do want to say thank you to everybody listening and yourself in particular for the opportunity to, sh- to share what I hope is uh, something they enjoy immensely. So... Um, My clients couldn't answer it, and I said, I'm going to cut to the chase because, you know, we're busy. Um, The number one uh, thing a a mechanic wants that he goes to bed worried about and wakes up sleeping about, sleep wakes up thinking about, as does Kmart and as does all the other guys, 
is profit. That's it. Hmm. That is it. There is no number two. There's only one number one, and it's will I make a profit this week? Will I pay my bills? Will I make an, enough sales to make my business successful? So in that moment, my words to Mark, because he repeats them back to me, who's, he's become a dear friend. We hol- holiday together uh, these days. That's what happens in There's a happy sometimes. ending. Yeah, there's a happy oh, ending. Oh, very happy, yes. very yeah. happy. And because um, they got to sell this business a year ago, a year and a half ago, for millions of dollars. And I'll tell you how good it is. Um, they got to go on Dan Kennedy's stage, the greatest marker in, in my lifetime. And... Um, and they won Marketer of the Year for the whole world Wow! based on this story and me purveying the solution that you're hearing today. Mm-hmm. So you're actually hearing the backstory for that incredible success Love story yeah. worldwide. So it's pretty big. Huge, yeah. So um, I said, and here's my words, Jeremy, we are going to tap in to the greed gland of mechanics. Okay, there it is. And, and, the, and, and Mark turned to me and he said, Mel, uh, did you just make that up? And I said, no, not really, mate. I figured it out at 22 years of age. And I figured out something that's a big secret and I'll reveal it sometime during our conversation. Could you please remind me? I will. To reveal that to you. You want me to reveal the it when you're 22? What happened well, at 22? Well, yeah, I worked it at 22, and okay. I'm 62 now. Okay. So there you go. And I'm using that same thing on them uh, 25, 30 years later, okay, that revolutionized their business that mm-hmm. allowed them to sell it for a fortune. So I said, we're going to tap into the greed land of mechanics, and here's what I want to do. I want to turn your motor into a subways card. Now, today in your world, it might be called a, a coffee club card where you buy five cups of coffee and get the sixth one free, buy 10 cups of mm-hmm. coffee. Everyone understands this, don't they? For sure. So they said, what do you mean? I said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you away from here pretty soon and I'm going to go and ask you to do your mathematics because marketing – and your crowd need to know, listening to this, is two things and two things only, and here they are. It's only two things. It's maths and then psychology, which is your copywriting and your marketing. Mm-hmm. So the mathematics, I sent them away, and I said, I want you to figure out how many motors, how many coffees they need to buy before you can give them a free one mathematically. Now, it took them nearly three months because... Carl was an accountant and he went and did his sums and I said there is no caveat either there is no weasel clause that free motor that you give away can be a Porsche now you don't give away many por- you don't fix many Porsches but I want you to do your maths based on worst case scenario right most expensive yeah, yeah. But, but but you know factor it out how many in in in, in the hundred is really a Porsche or a Mercedes or right, a, right, right. whatever because most of them are Toyotas and Hyundais and Fords and we have a thing called a Holden here in Australia made by GMH and uh, anyway um, they came back uh, some months later and said Mal buy five get the six one free but. That was three months later. Let me bring you back into my office again before the guys left. One of the comments uh, from the boys was, um, from Mark in fact, was mechanics don't read. And I said to him, well, they'll read this stuff because it's the very thing they go to bed worried about and wake up thinking about. Mm -hmm. And besides, I recommend you use faxing to mechanics. Because, and direct mail because that will get to them. It'll be touched and felt. And I can actually, if you like, after this, I can send you um, three faxes that they wrote. For sure, yeah. Where I made myself ultimately obsolete. <laughs> where these faxes costing $1,250 each time they sent them to mechanics that had never bought from them 
the actual faxes did somewhere between a hundred and forty and a hundred and sixty thousand dollars each. Wow. One page. And it's because I got all of this right. You know, that's what the real reason was. And I'm happy to send those to you so your members can have a copy if you like. That's generous of you. Yeah, that'd be great. You're welcome. We'll communicate with Jason. We'll take care of business when I get off the call. Thank you. Um, now, understand, that was a new mechanic buying the first motor. But what was he actually chasing? Profit. The free one. Yeah. Oh, the free one. Right. Yeah. The free one. Yeah. Because this whole coffee club psychology, it works. So I went and did it with a motor because the... The mechanic wanted the free motor at the at the sixth, which meant he kept all the money. So do you think our communication said, you know, buy five, get the six one free, and you can keep all the profits, and we don't care if it's a Mercedes, we're gonna you can have it for free. We didn't base our mathematics on that person that would deliberately rip us off. We based it on the whole success of the company. And during the same conversation, I said to Mark and Carl, we must have an outrageous guarantee Mm -hmm. or guarantees that scares the living crap out of you. Right. And it must have no weasel clause attached to it. Yeah. So it went on to be, if you, Mr. Mechanic, or your apprentice wreck the motor, putting it in your client's car, we will fix and replace it for free. How cool is that? So can if you wound the conversation back to my original questions, can you see now that you have incredible answers right. to that question? Why should I buy from you? Well, when you buy five motors, you get the six one free. You get to keep all the profits in that motor. And by the way, we don't care if it's a Mercedes-Benz. And on top of that, if that's not enough... If you mess it up, if something goes wrong and it is your fault, even if it's not your fault, I don't care, we're going to fix it and replace it as well. Can you imagine how they're going to, and they're going to go, oh my God, how do you do that? And that's exactly what should be the response. Because right. this is copywriting is what this is. It's yeah. being verbalized. Right. And that should be the response of all of your clients to the, from their clients and their prospects when they talk about their business. Mm-hmm. Now, what, what did all this mean? Well, it meant they won the world's marketer for the year for the Glazer Kennedy Corporation. And I was in the room for that and I, I, they attributed their success to me on stage. I'm very fortunate. They don't forget. Um, it meant that they got to sell the business for millions and millions and millions of dollars. It meant that you can't wipe the smile off their face to this day. You can't. They ring me on a regular basis and say, how good is life? I can remember at one stage they were signing up nearly six mechanics per day onto the system. Six per day. From disaster, Jeremy, from going home, everybody losing everything, because we got the one thing. Now, there's the nugget for the folks listening. If you can nail that one thing, yeah. It's not always possible, but if you can, they will throw money at you. And, and I've done it quite a few times for my clients in my life as well, and I could tell you more stories, but this one tells it very well. Yeah. So, um, you know, mechanics signing up like Billy O, um, and then someone came along from my environment, strangely enough, and bought their business. And now they get to lie on the beach in a sense. Um, they've now created several new businesses together, all based on this science and marketing that that I teach and that I, well, I didn't make much of it up. Um, I am a true purveyor and I've spoken on Dan stages and other stages in America where I'm quite unique in, in my interpretation of some of this knowledge I didn't invent. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of them... Uh, in that uniqueness is around the fact that the greatest product to sell on the planet, I'm going to reveal the big nugget right now. Okay. Um, are you getting excited, Jim? I'm excited, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Here's the thing, I've, one of the things I figured out at 22. Now, for a start, Jeremy, 
and that's the other story I wanted to tell you. When you asked me what one story would you tell us, and it's my story, I think. Yeah. From you know failure to to success, but the thing I asked myself way back then that I still ask my clients forty years later was why should I buy from you? Right. And I was a kid, and I just asked myself. I, I didn't read a book till I was forty-one. I never heard the market the word marketing till I was in my forties. And I have a bunch of world bestsellers. Uh, and um, I've got I've had five books in the bookstores, um, and I failed everything at school nearly. Um, so I just asked the right questions. And here's another nugget: ask the right questions. Most people ask none, and others ask the wrong questions. So I've got really good in my lifetime, and I think it's served me enormously well as being capable of asking the right questions and really. All of that has been based on re-engineering. So you, you decide what the end looks like, beginning with the end in mind, mm-hmm. and then you re-engineer back. So for me to predict the future for Carl and Mark, what did I need to know, understand? Well, if someone's buying what they're selling, for one. Absolutely. Yeah. I needed to understand the present. Yeah. That's how you describe it, Jeremy. You, to predict the future, you need to understand the present. So what was I getting clear on when I asked all these questions? The present. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then I diagnosed and prescribed the future for them. It was who they needed to become based on, based on making the future a reality. Mm-hmm. So when your president, John F. Kennedy, took to the stage, and I don't remember the year, it might have been 19... 19- 57 or similarly and he said we're going to put a man on the moon and bring him back safely in the next 10 years Mm -hmm. when your president said that I understand he had asked his scientists before he made that speech and they said it's going to take us 20 years and he went on stage and said we're going to do it in 10 you can imagine how their underwear tightened a fair bit (laughs) while they're listening to that (laughs) <laughs> and anyway they did it in less they did it in about six or seven years so there's another golden nugget the only way they kn- they were able to put a man on the moon is because they knew what they were trying to do so then they re-engineered back from man on the moon and they made adjustments to hit the moon because Apollo 11 was only on course 8% of the time The rest of the time it was adjusting. So in business, that's us. We're adjusting. But most people, their their adjustments are so dramatic that it's failure and bankruptcy because they don't understand, beginning with the end in mind, they don't gather the knowledge necessary, marketing and sales, obviously, in business Mm -hmm. because they're the keys, uh, to make sure they're, 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 they're... the likelihood of failure is very slim. Instead, they're like, you know, a flea to the next passing dog, the next shiny object jumping around all over the place, and then they mm. say, that didn't work. Well, no, it does work. They didn't work right. to make it work. Right. The only reason I can't play a guitar, Jeremy, is because I didn't pay the price. I didn't study. I didn't practice. Nothing is unachievable with sufficient practice. Right. depending upon your level of incompetency, where you have to come from. So um, the very thing I figured out at 22 was the number one product to sell on the planet for the rest of my life would be the opportunity for someone else to make money. There, there, there is no argument to this. It doesn't exist. There is too much proof. But luckily for me, I worked it out at 22, 23. So I've made my fortune by, by doing and being that. So let me put that in perspective. Uh, Tom Monaghan uh, could have kept making pizzas in Ann Arbor, in your country, and started a couple of four or five pizza stores. Or he could have duplicated his pizza stores all over the, the country and all, now all over the world and become one of the greatest philanthropists in our time. 
and he could have said to his um, store uh, workers, I'm going to make it easy for you to buy these because that's what he did. I'm, a, I'm going to give you an opportunity to make money as opposed to making pizzas and selling pizzas. And the only reason he is successful as he is is because he turned a pizza into an opportunity to make money. Now, the Catholic Church is said to be the largest owner of real estate on the planet, followed by McDonald's. Now, I, I was advised by a client this week who tells me he should know that McDonald's have surpassed recently the Catholic Church. I don't know if that's true, but either way... I have heard that as well. Yeah, I've heard. Yeah, I, don't so, know if it, I don't know if it's true, but yes. Well, either way, they're, 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 they're the largest owner of real estate or the second largest owner of real estate on the planet, and it's not because their hamburger is fantastic. Right. Is it? No. no it's, it's, it's okay, but it's because they, they created a product where they could sell the business for, I think, $1.4 million or something similar today. Don't hold me to that. I'm not sure of the numbers in your country. But they sold the opportunity for someone else to work in it very little, mm -hmm. and they systemized it, and they owned the real estate. Mm -hmm. So they turned their burger into the opportunity to make money. So I've made a fortune by turning a motor into the opportunity to make money for someone else. And my mm. mind immediately goes there. And that's one of the unique things about me that your, your countrymen have told me, um, that no one else quite pervades that the way I do. Mm -hmm. um, and it's probably because I figured out at 22 uh, when, I, when I started my first business because I sold it within 13 months to someone else. And then I only started a business to sell it, not to own it. Now, I think I'll leave it to you to ask me the next question because I could. Well, I'm going to ask further. about, obviously, what. So at 22, you discover this, so what'd you do? Tell me about the business at 22. Well, that was going to be my story because yeah. you said to me, when you asked me earlier before, yeah. you know, before we came online, so to speak, um, you said, you know, could you tell us a story that sort of encapsulates everything? And, and here it is. I'm 22 years of age, incredibly slim, slim and handsome. That's a joke. Uh, had lots of hair, and uh, but probably losing it fast, just like you. And uh, and I was fired by a multinational company, an, Amer an American company called Crown Corning. You'll probably know of them. Uh, back in those days, they they made corning wear, and they still do. Um, and they made lighting, and they probably don't. Uh, and they made glassware for hotels and taverns and people like that, mm -hmm. catering. And they probably still do that. And back then, um, uh, 19, um, so I was 22 years of age, so it's got to be 1974. We had mass firings in the company. Um, in every state, they downsized. And I was the last rep on. Um, and it was first rep off. Uh, my sales manager, who'd been with the company um, 30 years, lost his job wow. uh, as they joined two sales managers' jobs together, and he died two years later, never worked again. Um, the office girl um, lost her job. The storeman with six kids, he lost his job. So this is not new. It's been around for a long, long time. Yeah. And I lost my job. And... Um, I went home to my wife that night with my tail between my legs. Uh, I was going to get a payout of about $500, which was, you know, a little bit of money uh, in those days. Um, probably the equivalent to $5,000 or $10,000 today. And I said to my wife, I've, I've been, you know, put off a um, pile of downsizing around the country. And she said something to me um, that changed everything. Because uh, she saw something in me long before I saw a thing in myself. Uh, she said, and by the way, I need to explain to you that um, we'd just bought a house and land, uh, $20,000 in 1972. It's now worth about 500000 by our dollars um, in Australia. Um, and she wanted to become pregnant. So pretty disastrous no situation. Pressure, no pressure. No, yeah. no pressure. No pressure. And uh, she said to me, you know what? 
I, I can see you owning your own business. Hmm. I don't think you need to work for anyone. And I, I sort of was clueless and I said, really? You know, she said, yeah, I can see it in you. Now, I did something that most people don't do and they still don't do it today. I sought out the right mentor. Hmm. And the reason I sought out this mentor was because I didn't want to fail. Right. I didn't want, I wanted my kids to have everything I could possibly give them. I wanted my family to have everything they needed because I came from a broke family like most entrepreneurs or a lot of entrepreneurs. My family was broke and my father was an alcoholic. Well. So, you know, I didn't want that for my family. I wanted something different. So whatever drives you, drives you. So um, in in High Wycombe where I built this house, uh, I'd gone to a hardware store called High Wycombe Hardware in a suburb and uh, I'd bought a wheelbarrow and hoses and a whole bunch of things you do when you move into a new home. Mm -hmm. And I got to know the owner. His name was Owen McGrath and he was American. And he came from Rhode Island uh, in your country. That's New York, isn't it? And he'd found his way to be a naturalised Australian with him and his wife and both his all his children were born here, three of them. Yeah, in Long Island? Yeah, yeah. Long Island. Yeah. Yeah, Long Island. Is that what it is? Yeah. So um, I said to Owen, Owen, I've been fired. Would you show me how to build an extraordinary hardware like yours somewhere else? And Owen's hardware store was extraordinary, and it still is, because here's what's really extraordinary. Only this week, I dropped in there and met his babies, who are now in their 40s. Wow. Their name are Matt and Thumper. Thumper. Uh Matt and Thumper, quite an, uh, probably an American. We don't call kids Thumper, but that's what he's called. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, of course, they greeted me, and I said, how's mum and dad and, uh, and all of that? Because their hardware store has survived the 40 years of what the multinationals have done to the hardware industry in this country, and I think it's happened to yours as well, mm -hmm. where there's the huge stores – Sure. Uh, the Walmarts of this world, probably, or something yeah, Home similar. Home Depot, True Value. Home Depot, yeah. 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 Well, we've got Bunnings here, yeah. and we've got um, another one um, where the little store can't compete right. with them, really. But Owen, that store is still there 40 years later because I chose very well. So I what, chose what did my you see? Yeah. What did I see? Great question. Thank you, Jeremy. They had the stuff stacked on the pavement. You couldn't get in the doors. They had so much stock. It was stacked to the ceilings. You couldn't find anything. Only Peggy, his worker, and Owen found, could find the stuff. But if you wanted it, remember Bunnings, your Home Depots didn't exist back then. And, but if you wanted something, Owen McGrath at High Wickham Hardware had it or he'd get it. And on, at 1 o'clock on a Saturday... When the stores used to close here in this country, they'd shut their doors with people wanting to bang it down because you couldn't buy a hardware store on the weekends. I mean, how long ago did, did, did they change the rules with trading hours in the hardware industry? Are you old enough to remember, Jeremy? I don't know that. I don't know. Yeah. So, so from your point of view, they've always been open. Yeah. Well, if you're my vintage, you know once upon a time Home Depot didn't exist. Right. It was a little hardware store that shut at one o'clock on a mm. Saturday, and he had Saturday afternoon off to go to the to the sports events right. and have a barbecue on the weekend with his family. And he came back, you know, all fired up on Monday morning. So I chose really well because Owen's store is still there. That's how good I was with my selection. So here's your nugget: choose your mentors carefully. Really easy to write a book about something, a whole lot harder to do it. So be careful, but choose that mentor. Then go deep with that mentor. Mm -hmm. So I've had two. They've both been, I've had two major mentors and strangely both Americans. Hmm. So Owen McGrath and then a guy called Dan Kennedy who's a genius. And uh, I went deep with both of those mentors. I didn't jump like a fleet or passing dog. Instead, I went deep with them and I got it right. So Owen said yes to my request to help a kid. He's about 15, 20 years older than me. And um, I went to my mum 
who my father was dead. Um, my father was 55 when I was born, so I had an old father when mm. it wasn't fashionable. And uh, mum found a way to lend me $10,000 to her youngest son. Owen McGrath spent my mother's $10,000 and he spent it on stock, Jeremy. And the reason he spent it on stock for my shelves was because that could make me money. So I went and welded up the fixtures and fittings and I painted the walls and I painted the floor. I put the carpet, I put the tiling on the floor. I did it myself right. because there's a thing called resources and resourcefulness. And I wanted to use all my resources to put stock on a shelf. Mm. So I became resourceful mm. and I welded and I did the things you do when you haven't got money. Okay? Yeah. But I did something Owen McGrath didn't do because Owen's... I suppose left a legacy and his children have bought the hardware store off him. I know that for a fact. They've paid their dad. They went away and did their thing and came back and worked for him for a few years. And then they said, Dad, or the, no, Owen said to them, sell it to us. So Owen got to cash out and he got to leave a legacy. But while Owen was doing that, I bought and sold 20 businesses, 25 businesses. And I made a profession of buying, building, starting and selling businesses to my ultimate client. My ultimate client being the person that puts me on the beach doing nothing. So in this case, 13 months after I started it, I sold it for $32,500. So let me put that in perspective to you. I paid everybody back and I had enough almost to pay my $20,000 house and land. Yes. So by putting that in perspective, I had enough for a after 13 months, to have a half a million dollar home by today's standards, and I'm 23. So then I did another hardware store. So what'd you do with the this, first one, though? Go back to the first I sold one, it. right? But thoughts, but you you know your mentor is going to have this hardware store and leave a legacy. What did you do to get in a position that you end up selling it? Well, I discovered I was a little marketer, but I didn't know the word. So mm. I, I stacked the cans of paint four high and put a sign on them. Did you have a colour called Mission Brown in your country where everyone painted the brown, the fences a, a, a chocolate brown colour? I mean, maybe some places. I'm not sure. Well, I'm responsible for painting Perth with Mission Brown. Okay. Because, you know, I stacked in the second hardware store, I had it stacked to the ceilings. I won the Walpamure Dulux paint competition in, in my first year in the second hardware store. But when I didn't have a lot of money, I just stacked it a, l a little bit and I put a sign on it Mission Brown, normally nine ninety five, now $6.95 for four litres. I put the rakes out the front and I put them in a bin. And I put, I, I wrote a price on it, and I crossed another price out. I said, "Why should they shop with me, as opposed to each and every other competitor in my area?" So the questions have never altered. Right. They stand the test of time, and there's a very good reason for that. And if you ask me, I'll explain that to you why. So um, I then went and did another hardware store. I paid uh, thirty thousand dollars for it. I sold it for eighty-five thousand. But again, now I can, I can buy two houses because I've worked out it. and then I got out of hardware stores because I saw the big companies coming and my whole model is I only get into a racing car that people will throw money at me because they want to buy it because my whole model is begin with the end in mind that is selling the business to my ultimate client mm -hmm. that buys my business and then I lie on the beach I have six months off with my family I do the things and but I've been a marketer for years now, so that means I don't work in the business. I work on the business, right. if you like. Uh, and that's another major breakthrough for most people. There's no money in your product or service; it's in the marketing of it. So I've made a um, a skill of that, of course. Mm -hmm. So that's what's allowed me. But knowing I'm going to sell it to my ultimate client means every day I get to say something that most business owners never get to say. Would you like to know what that was? Yes. If I do that tactic, if I put that paint there, if I run this ad, if I stock that product, if I do that joint venture with that person over there, will that help me sell it for $50 million? So if you, 
it's the scientists. They got to say, if I do that to a rocket, will that help me get it on the moon? Mm -hmm. Now, most people can't have that conversation in their business because they never actually have a view of the end in mind. So right. another golden, golden, yeah. golden nugget is you must know what your business looks like in the end before you create it. Mm -hmm. And I hope the client, you folks are listening to so that. So what was the next, after hardware, you said you saw the big companies coming. Yeah, I did. Um, so we're going back 30-something um, years. Um, what was the one after that? If we had all night, I would make you de just talk about every single business. Yeah. yeah <laughs> From the beginning. I think I bought a news agency because um, they were very protected. You know, you know, they had all sorts of things like, like lottos and, you know, newspaper rounds and all of that. Um, uh, I bought a roller drone at one stage. What's that? Skating. Oh, roller, roller skating. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I had amusement machines in hotels and clubs and, you know, pinballs and jute boxes and pool mm -hmm. tables. That was a very good business, all cash too. It was nice. What have um, been, yeah, what have been some of your favorites out of the 25? Yeah, well, my favorite of all favorites, um, we, we call them delis here. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, tw 30 years ago when supermarkets didn't open after hours, in this country, out, we had archaic rules and laws where supermarkets couldn't open after six o'clock. Really? They'd close the doors. And uh, I, I owned a, a, what's called, what used to be called a super deli. So I had salads and mm. hot food and cold food. And, but I bought it doing $7,000 a week and my busiest week was $33,000 wow. in turnover. Uh, and I put, you couldn't buy, the bread shops used to close um, and I, so I put a hot bread machine in there, but I bought most of my bread in from wholesalers and people think I baked everything. You know, I put salads in there, I put pies in there and, you know, I loved it because uh, you're on your feet all day and you're meeting children, you're meeting old people, young people, all walks of life. Mm -hmm. And it was my favorite business, but I... Um, bought that for 175000 and I had an offer on the table of $498,000. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So what else did you do that worked in that business, that your marketing well, mind... Uh... Yeah, well, you know, I putting the hot bread in because you couldn't buy hot bread on a, on a Saturday or a Sunday mm. afternoon or day because all the bread shops shut. So they thought I made everything and it put the smell of the bread through, mm -hmm. the, through the place. I knocked down a wall between... Uh, two buildings but I got the landlord to pay for it he had an empty shop and I said I want to move into that shop but I want you to knock the wall down between the shops and uh, I want uh, six months free rent on the new shop that you haven't been able to lease which he said yes his name was George Frossos and um, I had to du I doubled the size of it because I needed production capabilities so if I was going to do $33,000 I needed double the size right so, you, you know, if you've got a restaurant or you've got a hairdressing salon and you've only got so many bays or so many seats, you can only do so many dollars. Right. So there is a, you can't have a level to your earning capacity unless you want one. Right. Okay. So I had to double the size of the business and I, I put all these things in like a massive meat stand, uh, cut cold meat, cutting cold meat and, and salads. You couldn't buy them on a Sunday in this country. So um, I was before my time, and mm -hmm. people were paying eight hundred thousand dollars for a, a really good uh, super deli, trading um, from six in the morning till nine o'clock at night. Wow. Now I just loved that business. I, I was young, and I really just I loved the whole cut and thrust. But if I if I had to say, if you said to me, what is the most, the best business you've ever been in? Yeah. Uh, it would be this. Um, and that being, if I could describe it this way, I am an information entrepreneur. Right. So, the, the, without doubt, the profitability, the, yeah. the clunk, um, uh, the need for staff and all those other things that make business, business unpleasant. Yeah. Yeah, it goes away. Yeah, it largely goes I away. I want to so hear about is... that. I want to hear about the <laughs> inception of the info entrepreneur. But, but I have to ask this, Mel. You know, when you... Think about the background of someone who's really successful. Something's driving them that's deeper. 
So I want you to talk a little bit about growing up because it sounded oh. pretty. It sounded pretty tough. Well, it is. Um, um, you know, I, I'm the youngest of four. I um, my um, uh, my father was 55 when I was born. When it was very very uncommon, um, my my brothers and sisters had no shoes. Um, and I, I'm considered the lucky one by them because I, I actually got some shoes. Yeah. Um, they knew my dad when he was young enough to hit them. Oh. Um, when I was uh, 55, when he was 55, when he was 65, I was 10, and he couldn't catch me. So um, he spent his whole um, life at night time sitting in a, his big armchair drinking um six to eight bottles of beer um, trying to get food in his mouth abusing all of us including my mother Uh, and so it wasn't the ideal upbringing but at the same token yeah that sounds just like a nightmare yeah no it wasn't it wasn't no it was normal to me to you yeah yeah it was normal I just made sure he didn't catch me Um, and we just thought it was a hopeless case which he was but, and I'm going to take you inside here. Yeah, um, I appreciate it. I, I, had, um, I had one of those moments uh, in my 40s um, where I discovered something. Um, and, and what it was, was I went and did a course called Money and You run by a guy from America, a wine American called Robert Kiyosaki. Sure, yeah. You should know of Robert. Yeah, of course. And uh, he, caught, bought a, he, he started that course in Australia um, called Money and You. And um, on, on the second day, it was the first seminar I ever did, and uh, on the second day he said, I want you to close your eyes. It wasn't Robert, by the way. It was a, a guy called Wayne Morgan who was running it for Robert. And Wayne's still around uh, in your country. And uh, Wayne said to the whole room, there's probably uh, a couple of hundred of us in there. It was in Perth, Western Australia, where I still live. And he said, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to imagine your father's in front of you. Well, my God, Jeremy, I'd had a a pretty rough time of it. Uh, He was now dead. Uh, I was now uh, roughly 40. I'd bought and sold, I don't know, 16 businesses by then. I'd done all right. And I had a conversation with my dad that I'd never thought about because of what Wayne Morgan told us to do. And, of course, there was people crying all around the room. Mm-hmm. In some cases, it was their father was alive and they were saying things to him that they couldn't say to him or whatever. But in my case, I'm going to explain exactly what happened. Well, I had my eyes closed and uh, I had a revelation. And I said to my dad, because my dad's history was he was born in Great Britain. Um, he was marched to the war office for the First World War along with six of his brothers um, by his tyrannical father who was the mayor of a place called South End on Sea who had, who had 13 children mm. and ran his household like an army barracks. So my father wasn't allowed to speak. He wasn't allowed to. Uh, he'd have to cut do the vegetables in, in the evening and and do all. He ran it like a like an he was army in the military. Barrel. Yeah, like he's in the military. You're right. So you can imagine he wasn't bounced on his dad's knee and and given much love. Right. So my father found himself being defending his country, fighting for his country in the war that there should never be another one at the age of 16. Hmm. He found he found himself in the trenches of France at 17. Now, I don't know if you know a 16-year-old. Have you got children, Jeremy? They're young, yeah. How old? I have a three-year-old and a nine-month-old. Well, sometime soon, have a look at a 16-year-old. Oh, yeah. And say they're, ba- yourself, they're like babies, yeah. Babies? Yeah. Honestly. So my dad... And then he fought in that war. It was a terrible war. And then when he went back to his homeland, the UK, at 19, my grandfather, who I never met, 
put him on a boat to Australia at 19 years of age. He Why? didn't put him back to the household. Well, the country was doing it tough. Oh. Okay. And, uh, I mean, I don't know the answer to your question because it's been lost right, in right. translation, if you like. But I know his first job was painting a thing called the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which is a famous landmark. It's like your Statue of Liberty here right. in our country. That was his first job. So I still get goosebumps when I go on that thing yeah. or go under it, you know. And here's what happened. And I'd never thought about it before when Wayne said, imagine your dad's in front of me. And mm. I, I said this, I, I swear to you, I said this. I said, you know, Dad, if I'd fought in the trenches of France at 17, if I'd been made to hop on a boat and come to a country where I didn't have a friend, um, if all of that had happened to me, if I'd been treated like I belonged in the military in my own home, mm. you know, Dad, I might have become a drunk and abusive alcoholic like you. Mm. So, you know, Dad, maybe I should cut you some slack. Maybe if I had been, had all those things that happened to me, maybe I would have been a drunk, abusive alcoholic also. Mm. So, you can imagine the conversation. I was crying. Yeah. And um, then Wayne said, he said, I want you to say goodbye to your father. And here's what I said, which I'd never, ever thought of before. And I said, thank you, Dad. Thank you. Thank you for being my first mentor. Thank you for showing me what not to be. Hmm. Can you see how profound that is, Jeremy? Sure, yeah. And then I went and found Owen McGrath, and he showed me what to be. And then I found Dan Kennedy, and he showed me what to be. And so my dad was my first mentor. If you, we, we put it in Kiyosaki terms, it was mm. rich dad, poor dad, I suppose. Just to put it in perspective yeah. for your countrymen here listening. I mean, what made you, though, you, you came from such a place of almost, maybe it was over the years, but understanding, whereas maybe people would have held on to that and never forgiven the person. And secondly, some people follow in their footsteps of their parents. Yeah. So what... Yeah. What do you think caused you well, to be that forgiving? It's, it's, and well, I don't know. I, I actually, I, I don't know if I have a good answer for you. But here's what I know: we've all got a friggin' story. You know, we can all reflect on how things could have been better. Mm -hmm. We've all got adversity in our lives. I mean, God knows. One day I went to work. One day, and um, not that long ago, about eight years ago and I had a perfect life and a perfect wife and by five o'clock that night I had her doctor say to me you have your wife has three to five years to live right. now I'm, I'm, I'm telling you it's not a question of whether this stuff happens it's when it happens right. and, and you know here I was I was successful my wife and I were having a ball we'd earned our stripes yep. and blow me down I went to the darkest place it is black there yeah. Where I went through that next um, three and a half years, I can't explain what it's what it was like. Everything I knew to be true one day was untrue the next. Yeah. So, um, you know, all, all I can say is no one cares about your story. Get over it, frankly. Just you know, and get on with it, and and take the lesson because mm -hmm. there is a lesson for you. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't feel like it at the time. When your wife is dying, uh, it feels like crap. Right. But I knew there was something to come out of this one day. Yeah. And, of course, I have a new wife and a new life. And last night I went to the graduation of my stepdaughter who adores me and keeps me young. And she's, she came to me at eight and she's now 11 or 12 and yeah. uh, 12 nearly. Yeah. Um, I was you know, reading it's a, a post that you wrote about uh, like one Christmas with like a PlayStation. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> with yeah, her, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I've got all these wonderful new stories. Um, my wife paid the ultimate price, of course, which is sad, but you know, I, I couldn't do much more than about mm. that. But, you know, all, all I know is, you know, it's going to happen. 
Um, yeah. Take the lesson. When it's painful, I call it unfinished business. Yeah. So I don't know when I'm going to see what opportunity lies here, yeah. but I know there's an opportunity. So I've lived mm-hmm. my life knowing that all adversity leads to something better so I don't get blocked up and car- and upset by when mm-hmm. something goes wrong. Yeah. It's just an opportunity for correction. And, of course, some of the greatest minds and philosophers of our time uh, have shown that to be pr- true. I mean, penicillin came out of a disaster. Right. You know, and most great things come from disaster, but it doesn't feel nice at the time. Right. Yeah, like right now, you looking back, you could say these things, but at the time, how do you cope with that, like you said, blackness? Just Departmentalization. You know, my clients didn't care if I was terminal. My clients didn't care if my wife was terminal, really. They would tell you they do. But if they're paying me 50K a year or 100K a year, what do they want? Profit, Result. like you said. What are they entitled to? Yeah. Results. Yeah. So I... I departmentalize. I had yeah. to drive out of that driveway every day right. and leave that behind me. What good to my wife was I if I fell to bits? Yeah. You know, I her treatment was two and a half to three thousand dollars a week trying to save her life using mm. a, a thing out of Mexico called Gerson. Okay? But she was too far gone. But at least she had hope for three years until that horrible thing came back. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, 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 in fact, cranked up my business in order to pay that sort of money. Uh, so for me to be useful to my wife, it wasn't any good me falling in a heap yeah. as well. That yeah. wasn't going to help anybody. Yeah. So there's some things I can't explain to you, Jeremy, yeah. um, about how my brain sort of ticks or something like that. Yeah. And I suppose it's why people like to hear what I have to say. Yeah. Um, and I've got to help a whole pile of people live more exciting business lives. Yeah. And I appreciate you sharing that because that's such a difficult thing to go through and I'm sure to talk about. So, Well, yeah. it, I, I, can still, I can still get upset. Um, mm. I, I'd be very care- I'm very careful on stage. I mean, I, for a long time, I could not talk about my wife on stage. Yeah. I, I cried in front of 900 people one day. Yeah, for sure. And they cheered for me. Yeah. You know, because they knew I was hurting. For sure. Um, um, and that, that that's an empathy that people can have for you as well, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing that you can't fake, you know. Yeah. So it even gets me a little bit now. I've got to be very careful. You know, it, it runs, you know, even the dad story got me about it two years ago. I was on stage in front of a, 250 mm. people. Why is that bad, and though? I, it's not bad, but mm. I mean... It's just it, in that moment, the emotion, you yeah. know, just takes over. I think and then, you know, we though. don't like, you don't want to cry in front of a crowd too often, mate, I, if you I can th- avoid uh, it. Yeah, but I don't know. They can relate to that because, like you said, everyone has something. And Yeah. It know. doesn't feel very good, though. <laughs> but I bet you touch them even deeper because of that. Well, I did. And, I, and, 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 you know, you'll struggle to find some nasty things about me online because, you know, my clients, <laughs> you know, I've shared um, um, most of the parts of me that I can possibly share. Yeah. yeah. Mel, I want it. you to go back to the info entrepreneur okay. and the inception of that because you said that is the best business you've ever done. Well. And how you started that. Yeah, well, so what happened is I, I, I bought this food business. You can call it a cafe if you like. It yeah. operated uh, a super in lunch deli, hours. A super deli is a good, good term, yeah. Yeah, well, this one's a, this one's a cafe, so oh, this exactly. is a lunch bar. It's different. Okay? I can't and, keep track of all your businesses, yes. I'll no, I know, and I'm sorry. <laughs> and the reason I was in this is because people were paying more for businesses and still are that work shorter hours. Yeah, that makes so sense. So a five-day yeah. business is worth more than a, a seven-day business. A business that shuts at 3 o'clock in the afternoon is worth more than a business that shuts at 6 o'clock. Yeah. So I deliberately targeted this industry because it's shut. Um, and they'll pay more for that because it's called Lifestyle Today. And I, and I, and I bought this uh, rundown but good-looking um, cafe lunch business in an industrial commercial area. Uh, it had been on the market for 12 months. It was owned by an idiot who was wrecking it. Uh, not my fault. Um, 
and I paid him 145 and I sold it for 385 hmm. And um, when I went to sell it, the landlord who owned the premises said, I won't assign the lease to the new owner where all my hard work was being rewarded for my final payday unless you paint the car park. And it upset the daylights out of me because this guy had had eight owners in nine years and I was the only one that made his premises into something worthwhile. Right. And here he is, he stuck out his hand and said, you, Mal Emery, paint my car park or I'm not assigning the lease. And it upset me. Yeah. So I went home to my wife and I said, I'm never going to have someone do that to me again. I'm going to stop buying, building and selling and I'm going to start a business from home. And beginning with the end in mind, I want to make $2,000 a week. Uh, and that's all I want. Well, unfortunately, it didn't stop there. But something else happened, and it's called the universe. Right. So I didn't know what I wanted to do from home. I'd made the statement to my wife. And we took a year off, and we traveled to your country. And I went to some beautiful places and some not-so-beautiful places. Uh, almost got myself in trouble a couple of times. I went to the wrong part of town, uh, quite by accident. And um, But I have some wonderful stories about all that. My wife and I did a world tour. Uh, we went to the UK, we went to all sorts of lovely places. This is my departed wife, so it was lovely because she yeah. was well at this stage. Yeah. And I came back and I still didn't know what I wanted to do from home. So I, if you don't know what you want to do, my advice to the folks listening is to make a list of what you don't want to do because mm -hmm. that makes it easier to find what you do want to do. Yeah. So um, my list didn't include buying a traditional business mm -hmm. again or starting one. Right. I wanted to work from home, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. Right. So blow me down, I um, decided to, you know, put the universe to test. My advice to everyone here is don't test the universe. And I got a phone call from someone that knew me and they said, mate, we've got this lunch business just around the corner from our business and you can buy this for peanuts and turn it into a money-making machine in no time and you'll make a ton of money and you can go and do whatever you want to do after that. And I went and bought it in spite of the fact that I knew I shouldn't. What made you do and it? Just because it was a good deal or? Because after 12 months... I was getting insecure. Um, I was getting impatient. Yeah. And I got so impatient that I decided to mess with the universe. Mm -hmm. Now, the universe was testing me. The universe was saying, you know, are you going to be sucked back in? Or are you going to stick to your guns? And uh, the universe then picked up a piece of four inch by two inch piece of wood. And it whacked me right between the eyes because here's what happened. I bought this business and by this stage I'm a crazy marketer and I'm not working in it, I'm working on it. And uh, I'm out the back and I'm doing the marketing stuff and uh, my, my staff called me out to the kitchen uh, in this food business and the, the, the chip fryer had had a malfunction as it turned out on the thermostat and it didn't turn off. And the fryer was smoking and the oil was going f black. And my staff said, we can't turn it off. And as it, as that happened, the fly, it burst into flames. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And they were shooting up the wall. And uh, I saw the whole in – a, in a second there, I saw the whole building being burnt down and I was going to destroy about three businesses. And I said to my staff, call the fireman and uh, I'm going to try and put this thing out. Uh, I grabbed it, what we call a fire blanket to throw over the, the fat fryer because if it can't breathe, the fire right. goes out. Right. Well, I'm a very bad fireman, Jeremy. You're not trained. You're not trained. I'm not trained, mate. I missed the, the whole fryer and I got it half on and half off. So the flames were still shooting up some of the back of the fryer and it was a double fryer anyway so I made a fatal fireman mistake uh, I pulled the, 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 the blanket off in order to throw it back over well in doing so I pulled the oil onto myself hey. 
and I gave myself third degree burns. Um, oh my I can show you scars. Um, on your legs? Where were they? Yeah. yeah. Mainly on my legs. My le- I looked down. My legs were on fire. Oh, my arms God. were on fire. I've still got some scars. And um, I messed with the universe, Jeremy. I didn't listen. And so the universe decided to give me this hell of a whack. And, um, you know, it's true. You don't feel a thing. I just looked down and I continued to put the fire out and the fireman oh. arrived. And I rang my wife and I said, oh, I think I need to go to hospital. Uh, I've just burnt myself. She said, what? You know, and... Cut a long story short, I finished up in the hospital about three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, they took one look at me and said, uh, we need to send you home. Uh, if you stay here, there's too many chances for infection oh, in a wow. hospital. Yeah. Um, have you got someone that can look after you? Because uh, I wasn't going to die, but I had third degree burns on my legs. So this yeah, whole serious. thing... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's serious, yeah. I mean, uh, it's a blog with a picture, and it's pretty scary. Or I can send you a picture. It's horrible. Um, and so from my bed, um, I got I, a, a guy like me got stuck in a bed at home. My wife looked after me, and we had a friend called Joe, a female, who was a nurse. And every day they came and dressed my wounds and, and looked after me. Right. And uh, I bled everywhere all the time, and uh, hey. it was horrible. It's um, horrible. Well, the... I stunk the whole house as the dead flesh rotted. Um, oh my gosh! Because a a, a burn needs to uh, rot to the depth of the burn. And third, I had a hole in my leg like that deep. Wow! Where over a period of a month, all the dead flesh would come out. Oh man! Um, you'd put plaster on it and it'd peel it out. So it was horrible, and I, and I did genuinely stink the house out with dead flesh and. Um, but I did something from my bed that most people probably wouldn't do, is I ordered um, a $25,000 uh, package of marketing education material. Uh, I ordered um, another package from Jay Abraham, one of your countrymen, mm-hmm. uh, and they sent it to my home in Perth, City Beach. And from the bed, as I struggled with the uh, burns, I studied my ass off. And when I could finally walk very badly, um, I emerged from that bedroom as a mail-order direct response marketer, Hmm. as an information marketer. So um, I'd figured out that I wanted to be, I wanted to start a mail-order company from home. So this was my first information business. And... um, my first product um, I got from my brother-in-law who had a recording studio. His name is Andy Priest. And I said, Andy, in all the years you've done this recording studio, have you ever had anything in here or somebody in here that really stood out? Now, correct. Now, what that was was the right question. Right. And yeah. he said, yeah, we had this guy called Dr. Michael Clark. He wrote a book called um, Sexual Joy, uh, and it was a fantastic book. And I said, where's Michael Clark now? And he said, living in Albany, Western Australia. So I hopped in. I rang him up. I found out where he lived. I drove down and I said, Michael, I want to pay you 10% of a profit you don't have right now. I'd like the rights to your book and an interview with you, which is pretty much what you're doing today. And he said, yes. And I made him a whole pile of money while he's retired. I wrote my first ad and I put it in a newspaper. I was a direct response marketer selling a product off the page. I studied my, my ass off of the world's best copywriters and, and people like that. Hmm. And my first ad in its first week did 9000 just under $9,000, 8700 wow. That's great. Up. And I wanted to do, you know, $2,000 from home. I then sold that for $250,000 as a business. Wow. And I started another one. It was called How to Start an Import-Export Company. And, um, go back to the to sexual. The, go back to the sexual joy part. So, what did you? What What did the ad say? They sold nine thousand. Do you remember? Um, how to recharge your love life and bring back the passion. Now, remember, you couldn't. Um, you couldn't go to uh, the internet. It right. didn't exist. Right. Uh, people didn't like to go to video stores. So, I got the rights to sexual educational videos. Um, you know. Uh, and um, I can't remember the titles anymore. Yeah. Um, 
but uh, I had a range of these products. That's called front end and back end. Right. So my front end product was um, Sexual Joy, and my back end products were all these videos. Yeah. And I marketed to them for life and until they buy or die. And I even had a, um, um, a, a, what you'd call a Viagra today. You know, I had a pill, a herbal pill, and oh. that sold like wildfire because, you know, it was natural. They bought this off me. Now I can tell you how to have longer lasting, you know, more fun. Um, so I created a, a, a genuine mail order company. Yeah. And then I started one on opportunity to make money which I knew was the best product. So, you know, how to be an import-export business. And that went off like wildfire. And, you know, even then I I wasn't the expert, I suppose, if you want to know that story. Um, yeah. I, I knew the market um, wanted opportunity to make money. And uh, I didn't know. I've never imported and exported anything in my life. Uh, but I did some research and found out that a lot of people wanted to know how to do that. And, of course, today it's become a huge industry with the advent of Alibaba and, right. you know, the internet and everything. I was yeah. before my time again, before my time, way before my time. And uh, I, I rang up a, a night school. Um, uh, I don't, do you have them in your country where you can go and study at night time? Yeah, sure. And there was a guy called Frank Moore uh, doing a, a night school course for seven weeks on how to start an import-export company. What made so you up, do that, though? You said you did research. Obviously, there's no internet. What did you do to uh, figure out this is the business? A uh, very good question. Do. One, I bought. I went to America, and I bought several import-export products in America. Okay, I was over there visiting Dan or something, mm -hmm. or going to a seminar. But while I was there, I made appointments. I did my research in your opportunity magazines. I did my research in mm. the magazines here. I, I bought see. every product yeah. selling import. How to start an import-export company, and they were very bad. Okay, and they're very cheap. Yeah. And I hit the market on a high-end product. Okay. And I didn't know one thing about importing and exporting. So what I did is I, um, so that was my research. And there's a there's a, a gold nugget for you. Uh, the reason you pay a copywriter so much money is not because of the copy. It's because of the research he does in order to write the copy. Yeah, yeah. The actual copywriting is very simple. But most people in business and mo some copywriters want to miss the most important step. So I mentioned the word racing car earlier along. I want a racing car, not a jalopy. So I had to make sure import and export was a racing car. Right, right. So it was. And uh, I didn't know how to do it, but I went and called Frank Moore. I rang up the night school and I said, who runs your course? And they said, Frank Moore. And I said, do you know, do you have his telephone number? And they said, oh, yeah, we have his telephone number. So I rang him up and I said, Frank, you don't know me. My name's Mal Emery. Um, I want to make you a ton of money. Uh, because <laughs> That's a good way to start a conversation. It is. <laughs> I said, you know, you, you, um, uh, you do these night courses and you, ca you can't do many of them a year, but I want to turn your, your course into a home study course and I want to sell it all over Australia yeah. and I'll pay you 10% every time I sell one. Yeah. Can we catch up? And uh, he came into my office. And, <laughs> That's uh, a golden nugget, time. Mal. Yeah, at your next summer, I go, there's one sentence you should say to someone to get you to business. And it is, you don't know me, but I want to make you a ton of money. <laughs> 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 yeah, I suppose you're right. Yeah, so good. So um, Frank um, came in, met with me, and I said, Frank, um, I wanna, um, I'm want i going to invite a bunch of people into a room. I want you to do a three-day event, and I want to film it and transcribe it. Uh, and I want you to do a seven-week course in, uh, in three days. Can you do that? He said, yep. I said, I'm going to pay you nothing for that. Uh, but I'm going to give you 50 bucks every time I sell a box of this educational product. But there's one more catch. I want you to be their coach and mentor. Mm -hmm. That's called the it factor. They actually wanted Frank. They didn't want the course. They wanted Frank. Right. And I said to Frank, I promise you less than 10% will ever call you. And years later, um, him and his wife took my wife and I to a hotel in Perth called Cottesloe on the beach. It's a famous beach. Mm -hmm. And uh, his, he said to me, I want to thank you for earning me more money in retirement than I've ever made working for a living I want to thank you for the fact that my wife and I were able to buy a Winnebago and drive around Europe and France 
being paid by you and then we sold to Winnebago. And um, by the way, you're right, less than 10 people, 10% of people ever called me. It was probably 5%. You're right every bit of the way. His wife piped up, and this is true as I sit here before you today, and she said, Mel, I want to apologize to you. And I said, well, why is that? What did I, <laughs> what, why would you want to apologize to me? And she said, Mel, when Frank came home after meeting with you on that very first day where you wanted to turn this into a, an import-export product yourself for a home study course, uh, I told him all that mail-order American stuff was a load of crap <laughs> and it'll never work. And i got to apologize for you. I'm so glad Frank didn't listen to me and that he went into partnership and did a joint venture with you. Now, with that, um, I invited Bill Glazer and Dan Kennedy and a whole pile of those guys and Yannick Silva, you might you know Yannick. He's a lovely Yannick. man. Yeah, he's great, yeah. Um, there's a bunch of other guys. Jeff Paul, um, um, a guy that does... Uh, the uh, does the uh, uh, the fighting industry and how to be fit and healthy. I Matt Matt Matt, Matt somebody Fury. Uh, Matt Fury Matt Fury yeah, and I brought them all to Australia and I ran an event. Um, I, put, I sort of got a bit of ahead of myself there because I, I I haven't connected the dots, but the, the bottom line was at this event a guy walked up to me called Gary somebody. And he said to me, Mal, I love what you and all these experts are revealing, but I don't want to create a mail order company. Have you got one I can buy? I said, yeah, I do. It's called How to Start an Import-Export Company. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 I sold it to him for 150,000K. I'd started out of thin air and Frank stayed with him and um, he wrecked the business, which is often the case, um, as it would be. But... Um, I'd like to in take you inside another golden nugget. Would yeah, that be all right? Of course. This is a golden, 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 golden nugget. And I said to Gary, he said, how much do you want? And I said, 150K. But if you give me 150K, I'll grandfather you into the deal. Now, do you know that terminology or not? Grandfather into the deal? Yeah. Yeah, but what did you, you mean understand? by it? What did you mean by it? Well, what I meant was if you give me 150K, um, I will give you $150,000 worth at retail of the boxes at $500 each. Have you, got a, have you got a calculator in front of you, Jeremy, or close by? Yeah. So 150K divided by 500, what's that? 300 boxes or something? Or 3,000 boxes? 300, yep, 300. Okay, 300. So I, the day he gave me $150,000, I sent him 300 boxes. And if we do our sums, they were costing me uh, $65 to produce. So 300 times 65 is what? Two, 20 grand. Yep. Um, yep. Nineteen fifty. Yep. Nineteen five hundred. There you go. You're pretty close. Yeah. So um, it cost me twenty grand to make a hundred and fifty. How many days would you do that? How yeah. about today? Yes. But what did I do to the buyer? What did he see? He saw all his money coming back at no cost. Right. So let me put that in perspective for your listeners. This is Subways. What does a Subways franchise cost in America? I have no idea. Um, let's say $400,000. Would that be reasonable? No? I don't know. Possibly. Well, I think you a know, Panera, say, like a Panera bread, someone told me at one point it's 500000 So maybe it's, I'm not sure how much a Subway is. but Well, let's yeah. for this purpose of this conversation and making a point sure. say, if you buy my Subways franchise, I'm Mr. Subway now. As opposed to all the other franchises out there, I'll give you your first $500,000 worth of sandwiches for free. Mm -hmm. Which one am I going to buy, yeah, Jeremy? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so you do your sums on that. At the most, it would have cost you $50,000. you are giving away part of a profit you don't have to get a profit you never would have had. And you've made your bonus your product. 
which yeah. means they they wanted the 500 mm. grand worth mm. of free sandwiches yeah. because that's at retail. It doesn't cost you that to produce it. Right. This is this is gold. Yeah. It goes back to the sixth free. It goes back to all of it. Yeah. It goes yeah. back to the 22-year-old. It goes back to the 22-year-old. So, but it gets better, Jeremy. Would you like me to explain how it gets yeah, better? Yeah, sure, of course. Well, if you've got any brains, uh, you'd go to your supplier who's supplying all your subways and you say to them, every time I sign up a new franchisee, I want you to give me 500 grand's worth of free food mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at retail. So guess what? You don't pay for it. Right. Your supplier pays for it. Do you like that? Sounds good. Well, it's not good, mate. It's spectacular. <laughs> because no one does it, you know, but the suppliers have all this money that, that you never asked for. And... Um, I've taught that to my clients. You know, I've got a guy that's done 15 million in sheds online. Oh. And I said, I said to a room full of people, go back to your suppliers and renegotiate. Uh, and he went to his suppliers and that, that was worth $22,000 net a month by getting a deduction. Wow. Yeah. Uh, net, net. Because this money out of thin air. Because they don't know how to sell $15 million worth of sheds. They only know how to make a good shed. Right. So your suppliers can pay for your growth, okay? Yeah. And your profit. So, Mel, I could talk to you literally all day, probably all night yeah. for me, um, <laughs> but I know you have things to do. So w what's one last story from the info business that would be important for people to hear? Oh, sorry. I didn't connect the dots. Yeah, good. So um, what happened was, uh, if I could just take this moment to you, connect You can take dots. as many moments as you'd like. I'm, I'm here all night, yeah. Well, again, um, while I'm trying to work out what I want to do and I, I didn't listen to the universe and I started a mail order company yeah. and then I realized the opportunity to make money, again, I had to go there, not just selling sexual joy, mm -hmm. which was a product. Um, I'd had people asking me um, how I knew, how I do what I do. And because uh, as, as happens when you're an entrepreneur by nature, um, and I'd given some people some advice and I went and asked a very dear friend of mine, his name's Chris De Spain, who was a lawyer in Perth and I, and I bought him a coffee and I said to Chris, I said, Chris, uh, you know, my wife said that I should be teaching people because she saw it again long before yeah. I did and what do you think about that? And uh, Chris said something to me that sat me on my bum. He said, mate, where's your qualifications? Now he's a lawyer. Right. And in that moment, I said, oh, you're right, Chris, I haven't got any because I was thinking, you know, MBA, PhD and all of this sort of stuff. And he set me back about three months and then I woke up one day and I went, hang on a minute, I've bought and sold 17 businesses, I've done this, I've done that, I've, I've sold this for 150, this for 385, that. I got the best credentials on the market, right. on, the, on the planet. The real world credentials. Yeah. Yeah. So then I launched my info business and I ran an ad, run, had, had to start a direct mail order company from home in your underwear like Jeff Paul did and that filled this funnel and is responsible for this business today. Off the very first ad, mm -hmm. I got a thousand new clients. Wow. Um, my wife downloaded them all and put them in the database. Um, again... You know, all the things you've got today that support you in business are much better. My wife did it on a telephone, you know, right. and we had a message bank we had to unload because it only hold 50 names, you know, and the people were calling faster than we could download them, three and four a minute, and, you know, it was just amazing. So that started and birthed this thing, and um, that's how the dots got connected to Information mm -hmm. Summit. Now, mm -hmm. you asked me a question a moment ago. What was that again, just so the folks know? Yeah, so what I was going to ask, because I want to respect your time, because I literally could probably ask about you to go through every, you know, you have these clients that are paying upwards of 150000 a year. Um, what kind of things do you break down for them? But I wanted to hear also just in your info business, you run seminars, you know, coaching. What is a great story? Although I'd love to go through every single one of them. I don't know. You, know, you don't have the next like 20 hours. 
what's a good one to to talk about as far as in the info business? Um, well, there's a couple of things that will make an enormous difference to your income. Yeah. In the info business, and one is self anointment as an authority in a category or niche. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I, I went up and saw a guy called Dan Kennedy, and I and I became the Dan Kennedy of Australia. If you want mm-hmm. to put it in perspective, people have said that. I mean, people who recommended you have said he is the Dan Kennedy of Australia. Yeah. Well, that was deliberate, yeah. Jeremy. Okay, I've never made a cent by accident. I don't know anyone that does regularly. Mm-hmm. Occasionally you pick up $5 on the pavement, but it's pretty damn rare. Right. So everything is re-engineering. And I saw Dan, and I make no apology for this. I saw her, I believe, to be the best marketer and genius. And, and, and I said, I want to be like that man. And I want to do that for my country because right. the internet didn't exist literally either. Right. And um, I modeled myself on Dan. And... Um, and you know, the no bull money guy, um, show me the money. And I had to change who I was to be that because mm. I was just an ordinary business guy that figured out a way to get rich. And, and But I knew if I wanted money to move to me in the manner in which I wanted it to move and if I knew if I wanted them to behave themselves because they're a pain in the ass, um, that's the client, uh, I would need to be the wise guy at the top of the mountain before I was. Right. So I anointed myself, that person, and today I've anointed more people in Australia as leaders in their category than anyone else can claim, Mm -hmm. and I could give you the list, Mm -hmm. but it's unnecessary and pointless right now. But So self-anointment is critical, and um, don't wait to be anointed. Um, You know, I'll anoint all your guys now that are listening to this. Uh, You're anointed. If you have to tell somebody, tell it, Mal Emery anointed me. Yeah. That's what's made me the authority. And um, I'll even give you a certificate if you like. (laughs) You can hang on the wall. And um, to self-anoint, there's a couple of things that really change the game. And one is writing a book. Okay. And once upon a time, writing a book might have taken you years, but it it shouldn't. It should take you very little today because you've got all sorts of things like Elance and wonderful things where you can just go and, and do this stuff. And have it done. So my first book called um, "Your Right to Be Rich" was a world bestseller. Uh, uh, even Amway ordered n- uh, nearly ten thousand copies. Yeah, How's I that? read that. Yeah, I read that. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. We found nine thousand four hundred copies or something. And um, so um, it took me years to write it, which I, I realised was a load of garbage. But um, it should have been quicker than that. But that that was a positioning weapon. Yeah. And. Um, it needs to be congruent, and the most important thing is the title, um, and then the, the title writes the book, and the, and the title of the chapters write the chapters. And I wrote that for a specific reason, and it, and it actually worked. Um, and if I extrapolate that conversation, I have um, real estate agents in my program that I wrote a book for because I got sick of waiting for them to write it. And uh, I interviewed someone that was an expert at preparing houses for sale. In fact, I didn't interview them. I paid someone else to interview them. I videoed it and transcribed it and turned it into a book. And I called it How to Sell Your Property Quickly and Easy at Top Dollar. And I sell the rights to real estate agents to use that book mm. and put their name on it. Yeah. Because I got and, and that one book, when they shake hands and say, Hi, my name is Mal Emery. I'm your local agent. And here's my book on how to sell you. That catapults you from the least trusted in the lowest 5%, along Mm. with politicians and people like that, uh, to the most highly trusted of the highest 5% of the planet. And you Mm. didn't even have to write the book. Just your photo on the front and a decent title. So one of the breakthroughs for me was writing a book. The next breakthrough, in no particular order, was being able to speak on your feet. Um, in the way I speak. So I get invited to speak with Donald Trump, Richard Branson, Tony Robbins, T. Harvecker, um, people you'd recognize. And I get, and Dan Kennedy. Yeah. I get invited up there because I, I teach and then I sell or I allow people to invest in my products afterwards. So for some reason, if you take to your feet 
again, they trust and believe you. Mm -hmm. So that's a breakthrough. And of course, I and I know one of your questions there was, you know, was there something else? Well, the something else is that I I discard, I I worked out what skills I needed to master. Yeah. And I was a disaster to start with. Hmm. Like and with I what? Ma Pardon? Like with what? You mean what I, were you I, disaster? I, I, I've fainted twice on stage of a panic attack. Really? Yeah, yeah. Speaking in language one no one understood. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I was the world's... I was, my, in my school, I failed most of my... I couldn't read. I was a very bad speller. And I hid at the back of the class. Mm. And it was almost child abuse, but in the old days, they used to make you come out the front of the class to try and read. And I would be worse. I would shake and stutter and stammer and my mates would have a go at me. And um, it, it frightened me to the point that I never read a book ever till I was 41. Wow. Um, I would walk a block past around a bookstore. I was petrified of books. There's no rhyme or reason other than the abuse I suffered as a child where my sisters and brothers said, Malcolm can't read. And I can't, but I've got five. Be I've got five bestsellers. <laughs> you know, I've done all right, thanks. And, um, and I, but I had to. How'd you um, get over that? By being un being okay, and this is very important. By being okay with being uncomfortable. How do you do that, though? You, well. Um, could, could I get you to do something while we're sure? On the go phone? ahead. Yeah. Please clap your hands together. Do it again. Now have one thumb over the other thumb, just like that. Keep it together. Okay. Have you got one thumb over the other thumb like that? Yeah. Yeah. If your left thumb is over your right thumb, is it? Uh, no. It right is. thumb over your left. Right Don't swap thumb, it. Yeah. What what's natural for you? Right thumb over the left. Well, you're a boring son of a you know what because <laughs> those creative guys have their left over their right. Oh really? Keep okay. it together, please. Keep yeah. it together, please. Yeah. Keep it together. Now there's some statistics online that's far more detailed about this. <laughs> okay. But I want you to do this again. Okay. Now I want you to cross your fingers over to what is unnatural for you. Okay. What does that feel like? Really strange. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. So what happens is I got comfortable with being uncomfortable. Now, there's a reason you can't stab yourself generally, Jeremy. Okay. It's because it makes you uncomfortable. You see, your brain, the last thing that dies on you, is hot-wired to save your life. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a thousand-year-old reptilian brain, and it's hot wide, so you can't, you know, you don't put yourself in the way of danger, right? Okay, or being uncomfortable if you want to put it into a different frame of reference. So, your bot, your mind is saving you. When when I went to pass out, that was my body saving my brain mm. to die last. Right. Panic attack where I got a hot flush and my legs gave way was my body saving my brain. Right. It's this, it was stopping me from being uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, what I'm here to explain to all your listeners is you're going to be uncomfortable. Right. There's going to be adversity. The economy's going to tank. Yeah. Someone's going to put a road through your business. Dan Kennedy's going to become your competitor. Right. I mean, it's going to happen. So if you're going to be uncomfortable, what's wise counsel, Jeremy? To get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Right. So when you invest with people like me and when, we, when they listen to people like you that are doing a, having a great contribution to the world and society, listening to this, for example, might make them uncomfortable. They might go, oh, I don't, that wouldn't work for me. Mm -hmm. When you say that won't work for me, that is your brain saving you and saying, yes, you're right. We don't want to make you uncomfortable. Right. 
because being successful, doing what most people won't do, being part of the 5% means you have to be uncomfortable. Yeah. And you're going to get uncomfortable anyway, Jeremy, because mm-hmm. the world's hot wired that way. Right. So how I've made myself uncomfortable is I've practiced myself out of incompetence on the most important skills that I was clueless about and had no talent for in order to raise myself to the top of this country and in some cases high in the world yeah. and I practiced myself out of incompetence. Mm. But my nature is such that I've arguably raised myself to the top, certainly in this country. So I'm, I'm the top at speaking on your feet when I passed out twice. Yeah. And when I was made to stand up in the front of the room, the idea of me speaking in front of a room full of people, 10,000 people, I nearly di- I nearly had a... I was at the back of the room having a panic attack. Okay? Today I can walk on stage and pretty much get away with it. But boy, oh boy, I had to be very uncomfortable to get there. Yeah. Okay? And that's why I get invited. Right. You know, because I, I was prepared to pay the price. Yeah. Now, that price is time. It's money. It's practice, it's aggravation, it's testing, it's all of those things. So here they are, in no order. Speaking on your feet, copywriting. The ability to put words on paper, as John Lennon said, I'm going to sit down and write myself a swimming pool. Have you ever heard that, Coltman? No. John Lennon said, I'm going to sit down and write a swimming pool. What he meant, he's just going to sit down and write a song. Because he knew he could trust his heard people who love his music to buy it Mm -hmm. the chances of anyone listening to this be having the skill to sit down to write a song that could buy a swimming pool are pretty slim right but i'm here to tell you anyone can write a swimming pool if they study copywriting yeah anyone it might take you longer it might take you shorter it might be fast for you it might be slow but anyone can practice themselves out of incompetence and in any event you're under the thumb of ignorance by not mastering it. Yeah. So never let anyone tell you how much money you make or how hard you work. And one of those secrets is mastering copywriting. And I know that's a big part of what you teach. Yeah. Master marketing. Because the only way a copywriter can write copy is by first figuring out the marketing. Now, that's a revelation to most people. Marketing comes before the copy, a word is written. So the thing you must master most is marketing. So when I said to my friends, we're going to turn your things into a Subways card, what was that? Marketing. Yeah. If you must know, it's called innovation. Right. It was called marketing innovation. And then we told the story through what? Copywriting. And I'll send you those faxes. Please remind yeah, me. Yeah, I will. And then, of course, I've raised myself to the top of the industry in copywriting, direct response marketing, coaching, consulting. I had the largest, highest paying in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, And that'll do me. (laughs) I'm happy with that. So I made conscious decisions to master skills that are not easy to master. Mm Mm-hmm. But everyone wants to master skills that are easy to master, Jeremy. You know, I, I read uh, where, uh, who's one of your great um, um, Super Bowl throwers of the yeah. ball? What do you Joe Montana, quarterback, quarterback. Yeah, yeah. quarterback. And what, yeah. Joe Montana? Is Joe Montana is right? one of the legends, yeah. Well, what do you reckon? In physics, I've, I've read that one of the hardest things to do on the planet is to throw that ball... Joe, what Matt, Joe Montana does, down a pitch, down a field, hit one of your players with it in rain, sleet, snow, uh, a bunch of huge men about to jump all over you and crush <laughs> you to death. And to hit that guy, I don't know, 70 yards down the pitch, is one of the hardest things in physics to do, Jeremy. Yeah. Well, how much practice did he do? Tons, One yeah. could only contemplate. Yeah, yeah. But how much is he paid? Do you know? Lots of money. I'm not sure how much. Yeah, yeah. 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 
millions. Millions. Probably a game. Multi, multi millions, yes. Multi, yeah, game. So therein lies the truth about um, skill and, and money. You want a skill that's hard to acquire because people pay you more. Right. This whole concept of I don't want to master stuff is an insanity if you want money to move to you. Right. So I got clear on throwing the ball. I was never going to play that game. I was going to get killed if I did. And I could probably never master it. He had probably some real natural talent. But however, I had no ta natural talent for any of those skills. Mm -hmm. So I got really clear on what I needed to master and I, and I then mastered them. Yeah. And I rose myself, raised myself to the top of those industries. And if there's a secret behind the secret, it's right question. Yeah. Right question. And a secret behind the secret, re-engineering. Because then I, I found out who was the best and I modelled them. Yeah. I'm sort of a combination of a few people, if you like, uh, where my skills are concerned. So I, hopefully I answered that question for you. And, and more, yes. And, thank you. You're now, welcome. This has been absolutely fantastic. I appreciate you. your time. Where can people check you out, check out what you're doing online? Well, just malemory.com. Mm -hmm. There's a free gift or two there that they'll love, mm -hmm. and we're happy to send it to yeah. them. Yeah, they should read all your blog posts, all the titles. Are, they're, I mean, just reading through the titles, you can get a lesson in copywriting. And yeah. just reading through the – just a, a great storyteller, obviously, if people Thank haven't you. realized by, by now Ooh. by listening to you. Yeah, gee, I, I can't let you go now, no, go ahead. without yeah. explaining that. The, the thing you want to master most – is the story. And, uh, you know, there's an argument that I should be sick of telling mine, you know, my, my dad or my wife or whatever. Yeah. But you've got to keep telling your story because they buy from people. They don't buy from companies. And you probably have to make yourself up. You know, I mean, not lying, cheating and stealing. You don't need to do that. But I have definitely made myself up based on what the marketplace wants. And the first thing I look for in every business is the story that I get to tell um, that causes, and it's called a segue. Um, you know, you, you, you open with a story into the real story. Mm -hmm. And um, all great copywriters figure out the segue. They figure out the story. And I suppose I'll tell you one very briefly and then we'll probably call it quits yeah. if you're ready to go there. And So um, I had a client who came to me who sells investment properties. Uh, you guys get that. It's a big part of the American economy too. Mm -hmm. And he said what most clients say to me, and this guy pays me big money, and he said, Mel, I want to sell more properties. Right. And I asked two questions. Remember the two questions are critical or what they might be. And I said, so what do you got? So what that tells you in copywriting and in business is you must have something interesting to say to somebody who might be interested. That's called message market match. Okay. You screw with message market match, you'll screw with your bank account. So my client said to me, oh, well, you know, I've got 500 clients that have bought one property already. They, sh they should be ready to buy another one. I said, that's great. What else have you got? And he knew what I meant. And his partner, Ian Barr, piped up and Ian said, Mal, um, I've got the best property investment property deal I've ever seen. It's in a place called, um, it's in, the, in Queensland. Um, it's escaping me at the moment. And uh, it's, the best, it's the best deal I've ever seen and I've been in the business 25 years. And he got excited and he got animated during my, our meeting. And uh, I said, so what's so special about this one, Ian? And he said, well, it's got the Commonwealth Games are coming there. It's got universities. It's got the largest shopping centre in the Southern Hemisphere. It's got the rail coming there. It's, it's the best development we've ever seen. And they've got a 6% buy, rental buyback. I've never seen anything like it ever before. It's fantastic, Mel. And I said, okay, I get it. Here's what we're going to do. And I had my copywriter, Steve Plummer, on the line with me. Steve will confirm all this conversation. And I came up with it with the headline called The Real Estate Deal of a Lifetime. Hmm. And I stole it from what Ian 
came out of Ian's mouth. It's the best thing I've ever seen. And we went out to the marketplace and we created a webinar. And we, we did product launch to their 500 and said, we've got this thing coming up. It's the best deal we've ever seen. I can't tell you about it now, but I'm doing a deal with the developers and uh, you're going to love it. Um, please register for the webinar. And then we did a series of, of, of contacts and, uh, and direct mail and, and email and, and all of that. And Steve and I wrote it. And uh, my web builder built the landing page. And um, then we, we wrote their webinar. I didn't write the content. I wrote the opening and the closing of the webinar. And we asked for a serious expression of interest. We told them the story about this opportunity. Oh, the place is called Rabina just came to me and uh, we told that story and at the end of the call 12 people filled out an expression of interest Um, 130 or 40 said they were coming to the webinar Uh, about 60 did Uh, to cut a long story short getting finance and everything 10 people bought a $500,000 property off a webinar amazing and all it was, it was, thank you, all it was, was the real estate deal of a lifetime. Because other than that, it's just another property. So therein lies one of the greatest copywriting secrets. Uh, the greatest master of this, in my opinion, the yeah. late, great Gary Halbert. I am a massive fan of Gary Halbert. I've modeled myself on Gary uh, above all other copywriters. Mm-hmm. And he was a master of the story. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if I, if I hadn't have come up with a real estate deal of a lifetime, it might not have sold two properties, but 10 on a webinar. So I hope you folks understand is the, the thing you've got to put your, your thoughts to is the story and the segue into the what it is you want to sell. Yeah. All right, amazing, mate. Mel. I, I've loved ca- I completely you today. appreciate it. It is amazing. I'm going to have to... Watch this many times over. So, thank you very much. Anywhere else well, that a, people should check you out? Because I, I know you have several websites. I don't know if you want to mention them. Um, I well, checked them uh, all out. I mean, Mel Emery, look, but I'm not hard to find. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm. Yeah, look, uh, you can pop whatever you like in there. If someone wants to find me, they can find me. Mm-hmm. Um, you can pop in an email address if you like to that'll get to um, to Jason. Yeah. Uh, I'll leave that to you. Uh, I'm not doing this with any vested interest yeah. other than uh, the, the the good of your clients yeah. and mankind. Leave um, your legacy. I've fig- yeah. I, I figured out a couple of things that you know. If you if you really studied um, this conversation today, yeah. uh, you will find that um, I've actually worked out the secret to wealth in business. Yeah. And uh, not many people can say that. And I've been blessed. Uh, and why do I do it? Because I. I don't want to think I could have helped more people um, live better business lives. Now, when I say that, I'm still not right for everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, People must walk over broken glass, uh, (laughs) butt naked, um, in a sense, because... (laughs) Yeah, uh, I like that visual. Yeah, Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, You know, wise guy, top of the mountain, you know, that's where they go. You know, I've talked about self-anointment, but, you know, I don't want to be right for everybody. Um, But those who know me well and you know how I've given today know that I really give a damn. Mm -hmm. Um, But I don't give a damn if you don't give a damn. Mm -hmm. And um, you've got to show me your colors. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I'm all for you. I'm I'm rooting for you, so to speak, in an American term. Yeah. Amazing, Mel. Too bad I don't want this conversation to end, but uh, you got to get about your day. So again, well, thank I'm you. I'm happy to do it again sometime, yeah. mate. I, you yeah. know, just give us a buzz. I was easy to get, um, easy to deal with, and um, more than happy to, to help yeah. you, 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 the folks associated with this. Yeah. My goal for this was um, that your clients go. That was fantastic. That was my goal for sure. That they loved what you'd done for them, mate. Definitely. Okay. Now, All right, buddy. Thank you so much. Pleasure. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. Mm-hmm.